today my mm, um, lesson is about uh, the aesthetic in the age of digital technologies and uh, I am first of all a philosopher so <coughs> I will uh, speak about uh, uh, conceptual problems that are related to, to digital technology from the point of view of aesthetics but in the title you find this word the aesthetic because the problem for me is uh, the fact that we have to uh, analyze how our experience nowadays is shaped by new technologies and uh, Perhaps I can say that the problem is also to uh, understand if there are aesthetic implications in this uh, shaping uh, of our experience uh, by new technologies. This is our main problem. I hope that my reflections can be interesting for you. I don't know what do you uh, what do you expect from my from my speech? But I will try to to say something. Uh, some yeah okay. I will give you some suggestions. But okay. And uh, um, first of all, uh, the problem is uh, to uh, grasp uh, what issues do new technologies. I mean, with, with uh, uh, by new technologies, I mean digital technologies. All the all this new stuff that we have in our everyday life, and uh, uh, what issues do new technologies imply from the point of view of aesthetics? And uh, I think that, uh, uh, first of all, we have to um, uh, keep clear if uh, um, the matter is concerning only more powerful technologies uh, that are perhaps uh, in continuity with our traditional technologies that we have as human beings, or if we have, we face uh, radically new technologies, and uh, what is the point of difference between these two options? Because if we speak of radically new technologies, we mean that uh, new technologies are not uh, simply tools at our disposal that can be equated to other forms of technology that we had from the, the beginning of our history. But uh, we think that uh, with this new, that uh, new technologies are forms that shape in a new way our experience. And this is a kind of question that is uh, really different from the first one. If we adopt the this, this second option, <coughs> and I, I maintain that we have to do so, if we maintain this, to, uh, this second option, we should say that uh, thanks to new technology, uh, the conception and the experience that we have of and with reality has changed nowadays. And so we must uh, uh, understand to what extent this change has happened or not. Okay? And uh, the first, uh, uh, the starting point of my consideration is. Uh, um, to uh, highlight the, fact, the simple fact of the aestheticization of our reality. We, we live in a world that has been aestheticized, so the philosophers use this word in order to stress the fact that our reality has a strong feature that is an aesthetic one and that we have to understand this level of our experience if we want to understand better our reality. So uh, the aestheticization is a fact of our globalized world and uh, we, uh, um, must, um, we must define some uh, elements of this process that uh, uh, involves our world. Mm? So, in this aestheticization of our reality, it's uh, sure that technological that, the, that a technological configuration of our experience uh, takes place. Technological configuration means that uh, 
uh, our technological devices uh, have a deep impact on our idea, on our conception, and on our experience of reality. Not only on our representation of it, but also in our constitution of uh, the reality as an actual content of our experience. Okay? And uh, the, the fact that new technologies are radically new uh, could be proved if we, um, we, we can say that uh, these technologies are not simply complementary, but they are substitutive of other non-technological forms that constitute reality. So nowadays uh, we uh, can get read of new technologies if we want to have an up-to-date uh, idea or um, sense of the reality. So we need to uh, use them and we can get from them some contents that otherwise we cannot get. Okay? <coughs> uh, uh, the test bed for verifying uh, this fact, so if something is constitutive, is asking uh, how does our belief get shaped? We have, uh, we can distinguish between three ways of this constitution or shaping of, belie of the belief. Of, I mean, uh, belief means uh, uh, what we think that is real, what we think that is uh, important to us, what is, uh, uh, I, I don't know, uh, what has value, moral value for us, and stuff like that. Okay, we had, uh, uh, we have, we know three ways of uh, of uh, analyzing this uh, this uh, belief, the, this formation, this configuration of our belief. The first way is the modern way, uh, for uh, modernity. Uh, traditionally, we think that our belief gets shaped thanks a uh, direct acquaintance of, with reality. We have a direct contact with reality and so we can get something that is the structure or supposedly the structure of reality in which we live okay then uh, in during uh, over the uh, 60s and the 70s of the 20th century uh, uh, arose a new idea of the construction of our belief in reality and this new way was the idea that uh, we have this belief thanks to the mass media representation of reality. So Marshall McLuhan was perhaps the most famous scholar that uh, thought that medium is the message and uh, stuff like that. Okay, And this, w this was the postmodern idea of the construction of our reality and of our belief in reality. Nowadays, I think that we have something different because nowadays we have a sort of virtual production of our sense of reality, of our belief in reality. Uh, virtual production, if you want to have an idea, you can think of the uh, I, I processes of uh, identity construction that we can produce thanks to the social media. In this sense, we have no a real identity, but we have only an, a virtual one. And so we become what we produce through this virtual tools, these virtual devices through social media, but if we speak of social media, we don't mean simply another kind of mass media, because social media are something that need, uh, how can I say, that need this virtual community that we establish thanks the devices, thanks the network of devices. And this is a, trans, a sort of uh, of transmission of information that is very crucial to this construction of all the contents that we can get in uh, through this system. OK, 
okay? Or we can also, the mismatching that, produce, that is produced by this uh, the virtual production uh, um, is uh, exemplified by another, another, another case. Uh, um, I, when I was uh, in train, I saw a three years old baby that was uh, uh, trying, so to speak, to read a newspaper, a real, an actual uh, newspaper. And uh, the interesting thing is the fact that uh, this child uh, uh, was trying uh, to uh, turn uh, the page of the uh, magazine uh, using the same gesture and the same expectation that uh, he had uh, if he had in his hands uh, a, a, a digital device. So it, it just used the surface of the paper, the sheet, as a screen of a device. In this case, we have the the, the, the precise idea of uh, a sort of transformation of our actual experience into a sort of uh, digital, digitally infrastructured, uh, digital constructed experience, okay? And this is, in this sense, I can, I can say that uh, our belief nowadays gets shaped, gets shaped thanks to uh, virtual production, not direct acquaintance, not mass media representation, okay? <coughs> In order to understand uh, all these, all these uh, phenomena, all these phenomena, we need to have uh, to a new conception of two things, both of aesthetics and the aesthetic, so both of a discipline and a content of our experience, and on the, on the other hand, uh, of technique and technology as such. And so let's start with the statics and uh, just a little, uh, very little history of this uh, discipline, just a little, three slides, no more. And uh, uh, we have to say that originally aesthetics uh, arose as a modern philosophical discipline. Uh, aesthetics uh, arose uh, at the middle of the 18th century mm? and thanks to a lot of scholars uh, who studied s problems related to modern philosophy. So it's a modern discipline and modern means that it has a precise model at its basis. Okay, This model was the Cartesian dichotomy between subject and object. Okay, this was the main uh, pivot of, uh, of all the con philosophical construction in modernity. Modernity uh, maintains that we must start from this separation, from this di distinction between subject, subject and object. And uh, this dichotomy implies a lot of other dichotomies that we have in our modern thinking. And uh, the three mm, most important ones are, you can, say, uh, you can see this, uh, uh, the dichotomy between self and word. We, uh, we how can I say, we, we um, relate ourselves uh, to self and to word in two different ways, okay? So the other dichotomy is the dichotomy between inside and outside. Uh, we are a sort of mixture between these two parts, but uh, this was the idea of the modern science. We can trace a precise line of separation between inside our mind, so the third dichotomy com uh, come up, comes up, and the, the inside and the outside. We are res cogitans and res extensa. Res cogitans as our mind and res extensa as our body. This was, so in, the, in this sense we have uh, for modernity uh, uh, two specific kinds of knowledge two really 
uh, distinguished kind of knowledge. We have knowledge with uh, its methods, uh, languages, uh, symbolic system, related to inside, to inner world, to mind, and we have other kind of knowledge related to body, to the extension of our reality, to environment, and, and, and stuff like that. And uh, uh, the problem for the aesthetics is the fact that uh, it has to do, aesthetics has to do with perception, and perception is a link between these two words. Uh, thanks to perception, we get information from the world, from the outer world, and we use this in our inner world in order to produce a representation of reality, for instance. Okay, so perception is relation between these two terms that are divided, that are strongly separated, that are strongly distinguished. Uh, according to the dichotomies, the, the, according to the modern dichotomies that we saw. And this is uh, the problematic stance of aesthetics as such. Mm? And uh, in, uh, when aesthetics uh, arose, uh, um, the main thesis uh, was that uh, uh, we have perception, we have aesthesis. Aesthesis is the Greek word for perception, for uh, perceptual or sensual experience. And this is a lower level of knowledge uh, in comparison to the higher level. It was the logic ones, the mathematical one, uh, uh, and stuff like that, but also this lower level of knowledge has its possible perfection, and this perfection has a model, and this model are the arts. Arts are the more works of art are the model, the possible model for a perfect perception of our world. In a painting, we can get the perfect idea of a visual perception of the world. In a piece of music, we can get the mm, perfect uh, representation of our audible uh, image of the world, and, and, and so on. Okay, so there is a, 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 strange, a strange nature of uh, perception and aesthesis, and uh, this has to do also with another aspect of, uh, of modernity, that is the um, um, neglection towards uh, quality. In this construction of knowledge of the outer world, uh, uh, for uh, science, for the modern sciences, uh, uh, the point is that we, we have only to consider the quantitative features of reality. And all the qualitative features of reality are not significant, are not important to us, because uh, they are supposedly only subject-related, subject-relative, so are arbitrary. And so we can construct a real science on this subjective component of our experience. Aesthetics tries to give another answer to this problem um, through this sort of path that, uh, that uh, go through the arts as uh, as uh, ideal constructions of our perception. So, uh, in this way, uh, aesthetics uh, can be considered as the form, the, mod the modern form of, uh, um, of uh, help uh, aesthetics to have an importance to our life, but uh, according to this scheme that is a dichotomical one, okay? And this is the problematic fact of aesthetics. The consequence of this, of, of this uh, uh, approach is the fact that uh, um, soon aesthetics becomes only a sort of philosophy of art. It uh, 
uh, forgets, uh, it forgot its root in the aesthesis, in the perception problem. And if uh, we speak nowadays of aesthetics, the first thing that comes up in our mind is just art and the philosophy of art. But this is a reduction of aesthetics that nowadays is not, is not uh, useful to us. Because nowadays we don't have this idea of uh, the possible reduction of the aesthetic to the artistic just because of the aestheticization that I quoted at the beginning of the speech. Okay? And this is the one of the main problem that we have. So, uh, I can skip this point, um, um, the other point. And um, another fact is that according to this modern approach, we, uh, we get also an a precise idea of what mind is. Mm. Mind, uh, in, uh, according to the modern conception, is a substance, and uh, this substance uh, has, uh, can have uh, uh, attitudes that are um, uh, speculative, contemplative, and th that are extraneous to action. When we uh, analyze mind according to uh, modern philosophy, we can see these facts. So we have only a mind that can only speculate about reality. Mm? It, it doesn't act, it, it doesn't uh, take part to the concrete action in the reality. Mind, for the, philo for the modern philosopher, is just a form of uh, uh, assuming a sort of uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, I don't uh, um, speculative or spectatorial attitude towards reality. We are spectators, only spectator. We don't uh, 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 we don't uh, take part to the concrete action of reality. It's so contemplative and extraneous to action. But uh, there is also a less influential line of research uh, in contemporary philosophy that uh, says uh, uh, um, another thing, that is uh, all the opposite. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, the American philosopher John Dewey uh, wrote that mind is primarily a verb. A verb means an action. When we speak of mind, we mean that mind is uh, the way how we take care of reality. I don't mind. I mind something means that I take care of something. So I am involved in the relation uh, with my environment in an active way, not only in a passive spectatorial way. And this is a, a turning point for all the conception of mind. And this is very important to us because we change the paradigm that is underlying to our conception of reality. So, mind is primarily a verb, is the human mode of staying in relation to the world that involves uh, mind and body as a whole. We don't have this separation between mind and body. Mind and body are equally involved in our relation to our experience, to our environment. And uh, this is also another way of focusing on the relational aspect of experience. And in this relational aspect, we meet uh, both the technological and the aesthetic as constitutive components of our experience. So we have just another idea of experience that is totally the opposite uh, uh, if compared with the modern idea of, of experience. 
we can uh, uh, we can get this point if we compare these two forms, these two kinds of creating a piece of music. The first one is a traditional score, traditional sheet where we just sign uh, notes uh, uh, thanks to signs that are conventionally determined. Okay. And the, the first way of creating a piece of music is a modern way of creating a piece of music. In this case, we have a precise determination of our skills that are required. The skills are cognitive. We must know the meaning of all the signs that we use, and we must uh, uh, know the, uh, the, the, the relation bet between this science and uh, the meaning of the science. So, the skills are cognitive. The dimension of this production is abstract because it's not a concrete action in the world. We just represent a piece of music, uh, transposing this piece of music into another symbolic system. Hmm? So, the problem of designation is important here because uh, the designation, or, uh, the relationship between the sign and uh, what is designed by, uh, the, uh, uh, designated by the sign, um, implies a difference, a distance between the two parts, okay? Then uh, the medium is a monochannel perception First of all, only visual, in the second, uh, first of all, and only visual, okay. So the score, we have to read the score. And for reading the score, we don't need other senses, but only eyes, okay, only sight. Then, here, the body is totally, completely, neutralized we don't uh, we we can be reduced to an abstract eye we don't need uh, our arms uh, our uh, i don't know uh, all the organic parts of our body and then the performance of uh, so the production the real production of music thanks to the score, is a subsequent, is a, a second step, another step, is not just reading the score that we produce music, but we can produce music as a, n another, a new step of our experience, if we are able to, tr to translate this score into movement of our fingers on an instrument and stuff like that. The second way of uh, creating a piece of music is uh, that is a technological infrastructure, technological constructed way of producing, creating a piece of music, is uh, 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 the opposite. The skills are not cognitive. The skills are aesthetic. We we just we decide where to put the dots on the screen through our fingers, uh, just uh, um, through uh, the way how these dots look like or how uh, uh, we appreciate or not appreciate uh, or don't appreciate uh, the, the sound that is immediately produced uh, thanks to the movement of the dots on the screen and, st and stuff like that. The dimension is not abstract but concrete, really concrete in this case. And the designation is not based on a distance between the sign and the designated, but there is an equation of the two parts. We immediately get the designated through the signs. The sign is the designated. We don't have this abstract construction of another level of uh, construction. The medium is not a monochannel perception, but is a, the synesthesia. We have uh, immediately the um, um, listening experience, the um, eye experience, and the finger experience. 
uh, that slide, my finger slides on the surface of the screen and I get a pleasure or not, thanks to this simple new movement. This is also designed by the designer of the device. This feeling of pleasure that we can get thanks to this. Okay? The body is completely involved because I must move myself in order to produce something and the performance Performance is not subsequent, but is a simultaneous, is intrinsic to the construction of, to the creation of the piece of music. So we have a, a, a wholly, a totally uh, uh, un other uh, paradigm, new paradigm for the mm, creation of, of, uh, of the state. So, um, that's why we can say that new technologies um, uh, has changed our idea of the state. As a matter of fact, perhaps we don't have the right categories in order to understand this fact. But uh, as a matter of fact, your real experience of the state has changed. It's no more a, a, a contemplative one, is a uh, sh uh, 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 another kind of it. So, uh, if we have clear in mind these points, we can uh, analyze the various ways how new technologies uh, uh, are related nowadays to, the, uh, to aesthetics, uh, uh, and we can distinguish between uh, trivial approaches to this problem and other more interesting approaches. So, uh, the trivial approaches are the approaches that take into consideration how new technologies can contribute to a classical conception of the aesthetic and the art. We have a lot of examples about this. This is only one case that I can show you. In this case, uh, the uh, fresco uh, by Veronese, Le Nozze di Cana, was just projected onto a wall, but uh, the experience that we get thanks to this projection is uh, just the same that we have with the traditional work of art. We can simply contemplate it and we just, we, we, we uh, have an advantage, uh, an advantage with this uh, projection because uh, we can uh, see this fresco contextualized in uh, its original uh, place and, and stuff like that. But the core of our aesthetic experience is the same. Nothing has changed in our aesthetic experience. We have just the possibility of having this experience in a place where we usually don't have this opportunity. But this is all. That's it, okay? So in this case, we have new technologies that uh, uh, corroborate a classical conception of the static and the art. Mm? They remain entangled in the canonical paradigm. Okay. We don't have the novelty here. Uh, if new technologies uh, uh, were only this, so we couldn't speak of a real change in our experience. Okay? We just have an empowerment of our experience, not a change of our, a paradigm change of our experience. Okay? Uh, structural novelties. We speak of structural novelties uh, uh, when, uh, and this is uh, <coughs> uh, an important point, we, uh, uh, we detect a shift from artwork to something else. So digital technology helped a transformation of our idea of, the static, of aesthetics because they uh, helped uh, to uh, achieve uh, the main goal that we can detect, that, 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 we, that we, we find in all the arts experiences uh, during the 20th century. During the 20th century, art, uh, um, the arts uh, 
uh, experienced this transformation from the uh, intent to produce artworks to the intent to produce events. So, from an object that uh, we want to construct to an experience that we want to allow to other people. Uh, thanks, uh, um, we, can, we, can, we can think of the um, performances, perhaps, no? so the, these performative arts that arose during, uh, over the 20th century, for instance. And there is a sort of uh, tendency that is uh, uh, detectable in all the arts uh, over the 20th century that uh, proves this uh, general orientation toward the substitution of the objects with an event. And when we speak of event, we mean that uh, the important thing is not the object that we have to face, but is the experience that we have to get. This is the great transformation of art. Technological, technological devices nowadays are very, very useful to accomplish this transformation. This transformation is here, uh, uh, you, you can see this transformation here with this uh, work, this is, uh, installation that uh, uh, is um, uh, uh, produced, uh, was produced by a French uh, uh, artist, uh, and that is the construction of a space where you can have uh, all the kind of perceptual experiences with eyes, with ears, with uh, nose, and all your senses. Okay, and this is another idea of, of uh, a work of art because in this case, we don't, you can't simply contemplate. The, the, the space and the place, you have to uh, get an immersive experience in it, and your body must be uh, stroke, must be must be uh, uh, involved in this in this experience. Okay. Uh, this transformation has produced a lot of other transformations in our conception of art and aesthetics. And artwork becomes device. We don't have artworks anymore, but we have a lot of devices. Thanks to them, we can have our uh, our aesthetic experiences. So uh, then, author is not a genius, is not a demiurge, but we have a multi-authoriality, a collaboration of various people in the production of a single event that we can experience, okay? And uh, we don't have no more, we don't have any more critics as uh, 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 intellectual scholars that can write a precise analysis of uh, a work of art, but we just uh, are satisfied with uh, the like in a social media. And this is, this is all for our appreciation, for orienting our appreciation of uh, artistic or aesthetic events. And we are no more spectators, we become interactive user of all these devices. And this is the fourth great transformation of our conception of the study that we can get thanks to digital technologies, okay? All these points should be uh, analyzed uh, deeper and deeper, but we have no time here to, 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 uh, to do so. And uh, in this new idea of, so uh, the last uh, three minutes, no more, eh? and <laughs> excuse me, Gustavo, but I, <coughs> in this idea of, of uh, uh, in this new idea of the static that we, that we can have thanks to new technologies, uh, we must also change our conception of 
perception as such, because perception in this case is no more a sort of uh, disclosure of uh, uh, apparent features of the outer world. Uh, perception is an exploration of our, uh, of our, is an explorative activity of our environment. Uh, we can't be passive in perception. We must be also active in perception. This is a new form of new idea, new conception of perception, and that is also another critique against the modern conception of mind and of our experience. Uh, a device becomes a medium which is not simply available to the organism, but which creates an experiential field common to both the organism and its environment. So we are in the relation. We are not a substance that is related to other substances, but we are part factors of a a, a, a network of relationship, uh, of relations, and these relations are the main, the only uh, uh, possible substances of our world. Mm? This is a great uh, novelty. Um, we can find, we can uh, have all these, uh, all these. Um, uh, facts uh, uh, summarized in a new form of uh, work of art that are, f and this is the form of work of art that is uh, uh, comparable to video game. So video games are a new form of aesthetic creativity nowadays and there are a lot of artists that use this, uh, this, uh, this uh, new forms of uh, creativity in order to produce uh, um, uh, new uh, um, uh, events, new aesthetic events uh, for our experience. So, video games uh, are perhaps uh, a new possible paradigm for work of art. We can, uh, um, we can have the idea of this uh, in two ways. First of all, we can analyze how nowadays uh, uh, museums uh, are conceived. Here is a, an interesting example, and I want to show you a clip, uh, in, in two, two minutes of a clip, about the Cleveland Museum of uh, Cleveland Museum and the part of it that uh, uh, is called Arts Gallery One. Uh, Gallery One. Okay, this is the experience that you can have uh, thanks to digital technologies and according to, to this new concept of the static that is interactive, that is not passive, that is uh, another kind of uh, artistic content. Just, uh, I don't know if it works. We don't have audio, audio. Audio, or excuse me. No, here. No, here. Okay. Cleveland. Cleveland. I think that is the, the, perhaps the, the, the most beautiful uh, example for this use of technology in relation to traditional art, but. Uh, the use, uh, the usage is totally different. There is no contemplative action in the user, and uh, the body is totally involved all this, and uh, uh, the user get experience, not knowledge in a sort of traditional spiritual way. But we 
other interesting point is uh, uh, the use of children in society of this previous time. Another another exa possible example that we can we can number five okay just a just a minute okay excellent another possible example that, that we can uh, uh, show about this new conception of uh, uh, a kind of experience that is not modern at all, uh, but because it's so playful, mm, and this playfulness is the, the point of difference with the modern conception, is uh, about music, and we have here another audio. Uh, oh. The first step is only the demonstration of how this, uh, this system works. possibility is this one okay this is not so astonishing but perhaps uh, interesting because the use that you can have of all this is this one this is the third the third form and all this okay but uh, then uh, I, f I find very interesting the usage that uh, is displayed here First of all, with children, and as you can see, children are very clever with these uh, tools. Hmm? They exploit all the opportunities. As a, as a uh, welcome to expand your musical mind. So we don't have anymore a mind that is only in our skull. <laughs> we have a mind that is expanded in uh, thanks to the technological devices. So our technolo technological devices are extension of a mind if we consider mind as a verb, not as a substance, substance. So we must change all these ideas if you want to have, if you want to understand the sense of the state. And just in conclusion, I want to say uh, this. 
no, this is all, also this is very interesting, this is a, a sort, this is a, a, real, uh, a real work of art uh, produced in uh, Chiasma Museum in Helsinki, uh, Survivor is the title, and uh, this is the real space of the museum, it is very, very beautiful, and this is the virtual uh, space produced thanks to this uh, device, and this is the user that is in the real space and is producing a virtual image of the museum, and uh, uh, he gets experience because he has to play with this as in a video game, and he has levels to pass, he has all this uh, fact, and uh, in this, uh, the, the, the important thing and is that in this way he can access uh, uh, a dimension, an aesthetic dimension that otherwise was imp uh, uh, was would be impossible to access in. Okay, so uh, the experience that the user has when he plays with this game is a virtual one, but is a totally new one that is impossible to so-called real user of the same space, of the same place, okay? This is the new uh, dimension of the aesthetic that is a, a sort of increasing of our normal experience of our world, okay? The last point, if we wanna, if you wanna, in a theoretical way, in a theoretical way, uh, determine the point, the, 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 the result of this analysis, uh, uh, if you wanna stress this point of arrival, we should say that uh, we have to uh, uh, skip from an idea of experience of something, the modern idea is the idea that uh, the subject has an experience of an object. So we have this dichotomy as a basis, and then we try to find a relation between <laughs> two parts that are divided, that are separated from each other, okay? This was the modern conception of experience experience of something. The new idea that we have, thanks to museums like Flu in Cleveland, or works of art, or, or uh, other forms, is that we have an experience with something. We are, we take part, we take part to an experience where other vectors, our uh, forces are involved and these, force, uh, these forces are forces that can be also technological devices. So a technological device is no more simple, uh, simply a sort of uh, tool that we have at our disposal. A, a technological device is a sort of other person that is related to us and there is a dialogue with this other person and, th and the experience is just the production of this dialogue that we have with the digital, digital uh, device. So the device is no more simply uh, an interface, a sort of uh, appearance that we have, uh, that we are facing in this moment, for instance, but becomes an interlocutor for us. We speak together. And this is what uh, Gustavo will show you, uh, speaking of how new technologies uh, uh, has changed in relation to the idea or the possibility or the configurations, the possible configurations of perception uh, meant as or uh, regarded uh, to, um, uh, on the light of uh, the relationship between human beings and, uh, uh, and uh, computers and uh, uh, digital, digital tools uh, and stuff like that. So that is for me and then come 
the more interesting part of, of, uh, of the lesson that is Gestalmer here at work. Ci sono tutto qua lo stavo io. Eh? Ok, do you have any idea in your intanto so a question instead of uh, presenting how many hardcore computer scientists are there in this room? Background in computer science? This one here. This one? Okay, so for other presentations it's not a big problem. So hopefully, I'll do this. Okay, so th first of all, thank you to Giovanni. Thanks, Giovanni, for introducing uh, actually what we've been working on uh, in the past few months. So, um, and uh, uh, let me introduce myself instead. So, why I asked any computer scientist in the room? Well, because I'm actually a computer scientist. I'm uh, really uh, the type of guy that started with bits. Okay, so uh, very far away from uh, aesthetic studies, um, anything that you are doing in, uh, in this class. So I, I'm talking about my initial experience when I was really uh, programming smartphones around 2000, 2001. Smartphones weren't on the market yet, but I was doing that. And uh, we didn't really care about human computer interfaces. The, what they would tell us was, okay, if you should be able to do anything on your interface in two, three clicks at most. But we were mostly concerned about packets, bits, and uh, information flowing in a network. So that's uh, the, the, the background. And uh, uh, things have changed really a lot, okay? Things have changed really a lot in, in these years. And uh, what's interesting, and this is not, this is my, my little experience, but I, I also had the luck of uh, talking on some, with some of the uh, founding fathers of the internet, some uh, I've worked, uh, I had also the luck of working uh, with, and uh, they really didn't have this type of perception either. They were engineers working on bits as well. So uh, there, there was no idea of what could be uh, the huge impact of what they were doing at the time, okay? Um, for example, Two years ago, I was talking to Paul Mocapetris. If you look online, he's in the Internet Hall of Fame. And uh, at the time, he was writing the first mail server, okay? The first email server of, in history was written by this guy. And uh, uh, he went... <laughs> no, no, that, he is old, uh, not me. <laughs> it's better he doesn't live, hear that. But, <laughs> well... He, he, uh, and uh, uh, before writing it, he was um, talking to guys in the sociology department and said, well, uh, uh, sociology department, he said, well, great experiment. Uh, we should, uh, before doing that, uh, uh, perform a sociological study of what could be the impact and see what, uh, and he said, well, no, I'll just write it and put it out. And uh, that's what happened and, you know, story then. Uh, all of us know how, how much we use mail servers now. So uh, this is the kind of attitude uh, that, uh, especially in the past, now uh, less computer scientists have. And uh, so when I started understanding uh, and uh, uh, discussing with Giovanni uh, what could be the points of contact between aesthetic studies and uh, uh, computer science, uh, I clearly, uh, I, I found a problem. It was a, a big problem for me because uh, I didn't really know much about aesthetics, okay? So I, I needed to get uh, into uh, where we could uh, find uh, intersection points. And uh, at most, the idea I had uh, concerning aesthetics was, uh, 
okay, there is clearly aesthetic work uh, from the computer science community on understanding what is the value, for example, of an interface. Okay, so there's been a good amount of work, and if you look in literature, you'll find a good amount of work in that direction. But so uh, thinking about this, and this was uh, really revealing for me and uh, helped me uh, really a lot, was uh, getting to read this definition by the founder of uh, uh, the aesthetic branch of philosophy. So I read that aesthetics, the theory of liberal arts, the logic of the lower capacity of cognition, uh, well, and, and then you read the rest of it, is about, this is the central part, is the science of sensible cognition or perception. So I, I read perception. Uh, why uh, perception really changes so much uh, the point of view for me? Well, because uh, you're all familiar with what Web 2.0 means prosumerism, uh, those types of concepts uh, uh, should be familiar. And uh, well, you know, we are all producers of content, we're all consumers of content, and uh, we, uh, through the use of computer system, have changed the way that we perceive reality. Okay, so there is really a change of perception, and uh, not only a change of perception, but also a way of how we are actually communicating this perception to others. Okay, we don't place a phone call anymore, we write a post. And post uh, on uh, a social media gives a different perception, perhaps, compared to a phone call. So this was really revealing, and uh, uh, then I started understanding also, well, aesthetics is not only about uh, perception in its root, but also about, uh, um, uh, please correct me if when I say <laughs> anything wrong, but it, it's about uh, uh, actually a filtered part of that perception. So quality is also part of it. So it's not only basic perception, but you also have a concept of quality in it, okay? So this was really revealing a, a definition of aesthetic for me, aesthetics for me. And uh, uh, so I, I went back looking at uh, definitions of uh, computer science. So we actually have a, a grounded definition of computer science, and one of uh, uh, the first one that was accepted in uh, the communication of ACM is one of the um, uh, flagship journals for uh, computer scientists, uh, was, uh, uh, well, a uh, fundamental question underlying all of computing is, what can be efficiently automated? And this is uh, uh, the old school definition. So we really care about uh, automating things. Things should be automatically done, and uh, not only automatically done, but also efficiently. We care about efficiency in what we do, okay? So information transformations in an efficient way. Hmm? But 1989, okay? pre-web era, pre-web web, web 2.0, pre-AI at the stage we have AI today. So many things have changed, pre-VR, uh, now we have virtual reality that is really kicking in. So things have changed really a lot. The perspective has changed really a lot. And from the same authors, if you look at uh, literature, you find that in 2008, uh, there is a different perspective and uh, a more uh, complex perspective. So you cannot really reduce computer science to a definition where you want to automate in an efficient way uh, procedures. You think of computer science as something that has to do with all aspects of human life, okay? So you actually see Computing implemented clearly by uh, mechanical, optical, electronic, etc., but it also has uh, other uh, parts that are relevant there, like social parts, life, computing, what part of computing that you're actually using. So computing implemented by what computing implements computing influenced by, but what does computing also influence and uh, where do we have this bi-directional bi influence? So 
you see, it's, it becomes a, a much more complex uh, scenario that we have in front of us, okay? And uh, <coughs> when you think of computer science, you don't, sh you still shouldn't think of computer science as a subset of uh, other sciences, but uh, as a, a science that uh, uh, is of interest to all other sciences, but is the only one that really focuses on uh, the transformation of information, okay? In all of these aspects. So it is really fundamental to all domains of science, and uh, I would say also to humanities, otherwise you wouldn't be here, okay? And so uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, reasoning on uh, points of uh, contact between aesthetics and uh, computer science, you find we see that uh, there is uh, actually many, many and many points of contact. So we have uh, aesthetics on one side that is concerned with human perception, but we know that human perception is influenced by computer systems, okay? We know that, uh, uh, what is perception? Perception, uh, we perceive some information. And who is concerned with information? It's computer systems, okay? As uh, we perceive it, or as a computer system represent this information. So, uh, with human perception, we uh, basically have uh, this point of contact clearly with the physical world, but uh, what happens if we look at uh, the universe of all possible information that is out there, well, on one side, uh, let me now differentiate, uh, when I talk about computer, computers, I'll talk about sensing, when instead for human beings I'll say perception. Well, we, we, we can see two, sub, two sets there, right? We can see a physical world of all possible information, and we can see on one side, uh, actually I made a mistake with what I said, so human perceived models, okay? So uh, on one side we have uh, how human beings uh, uh, relate to these physical models, to these information models, okay? On the other side we have how computer systems relate to those models, and uh, while uh, so this is, a, uh, I, I'm clearly not an, an, an expert in this, but I, I, while I think that we can expect that more or less human beings uh, may be modeled uh, in a way that this set won't really change in time too much, okay? So uh, there is clearly evolution ongoing, but uh, I expect that for a few thousand years we will, we, we will consider more or less the same model. On the other side, what happens is that computer systems are moving fast, are moving fast. And so they're not only able to capture things that we're not able to perceive, okay? Think of, uh, uh, when, I, uh, when I say computer system, I intend it in a very extensive way. So think of a sensor that can see I don't know, infrared light, so something that we cannot actually perceive, okay? A sensor can see that physical phenomenon, we can't. Hmm? But in addition, what happens is that this set is getting more and more to cover what human perception is. So computers are learning to perceive as humans do. What does that mean? Think of AI. There are more and more systems that are being built to interact or to understand things as a human being would be doing that. Hmm? I don't know if I made a point here. Okay? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, naturally. Yeah, here we, here we, uh, this in this uh, model. Uh, yes, it's uh, yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. It's um, um, so human without any technology, just a human being, as uh, as <laughs> as Darwin uh, <laughs> or as nature has. Uh, uh, exactly. Okay, so you see, we have. Uh, uh, if you think of it, in, in the end, uh, we have uh, three actors in our system. So we have the physical world, okay? We have computer systems, and we have human beings. And uh, the point is how these relate and uh, what is the role of uh, aesthetics in all of this. So if we look at aesthetics, as a perception or a filtered perception, okay, so a perception at a higher level where we have also a concept of quality of perception, well, we can find uh, uh, different models and we can find uh, different ways to map all of this uh, uh, information. So we, we, the, the classical uh, relationship here is a uh, human model of reality, okay? But then we have uh, a human model built starting from a computational model of reality. And that could be, in one case, it could be filtered out. It's, some, it's a subset of that, okay? But it's not only a subset. It shouldn't be only a subset. It can also be a, a superset of reality that you build through a computational model. Why? Because systems, computer systems, sensors can give us new ways of perceiving the out, uh, outer reality, okay? Uh, so here I list, this is very uh, mathematical or computer science <laughs> point of view, but well, w the moment that you have these actors and you have an idea of relationships, you can start thinking of all the possible relationships that there may be there. So one-to-one, -one part of shift, augmented. Yeah, you can actually think of systems that augment reality. You have probably heard of what an augmented reality system is. So what does that mean? You have reality and you're actually adding information into it, okay? or it could be completely virtual. So from this starting point, what we did was thinking of uh, what are all, so this is on, uh, ongoing work that we uh, are planning to finish very, very soon, but what, what, what we're doing is uh, uh, look at all the possible relationships that we can have playing uh, with these actors, okay? So we have human perception versus computer sensing. So yes, this is the classical model. And uh, this, let me say, would be the 20 years ago model, or at least 20 years ago model, where a computer scientist wouldn't really think that a human being would be so influenced by a computer system. Not because 20 years ago uh, people wouldn't think about it, but simply because there wasn't a so pervasive use of these systems among people. Hmm? Well, things can change. So things can change because you can have a computer system that is in the middle between reality and uh, the human being. So you do not have a direct experience of reality, but you have uh, an indirect experience of reality using a computer system. So try to name one of these, uh, you probably have so many experiences of this, but try to name one. I'm sure everybody has. Anybody? Well, uh, <coughs> let, let, let's say the, the simplest thing. For example, we use uh, systems, for example, to drive around or to tell us what traffic conditions are, okay? So we build up a model of uh, what we will be experiencing on a road, okay? 
using a navigator. I already know I'm going to find lots of traffic or not. Uh, if it's really early in the morning, I still didn't have time to get up, I'll see on my phone, is it raining outside? So I have a model if it's raining or not outside, if I didn't hear any rain with my ears, okay? So I build a perception of the outside world through a computer system. We, we do that all the time, okay? Uh, create and uh, represent. So this is really uh, something that is happening now. So consider 2016 was uh, uh, said being uh, the year zero for virtual reality. Why year zero for virtual reality? Well, virtual reality systems have been around for a while, especially military and um, uh, also medical uh, areas have been investing lots of money in this. But uh, year zero because it becomes affordable. Hmm? More and more people are buying this system. Anybody play computer games here? PlayStation? Okay. So if you play PlayStation, you will soon be buying a VR because uh, using a VR, you will also experience virtual reality on your games, okay? And uh, so uh, something you should always be careful, uh, look at and pay attention to is always look new technologies that are used in gaming. If they get into gaming, sooner or later they will get to everyone, okay? That's what happened with uh, social media. That's uh, a, a trend because technology gets in our houses through kids. So, <laughs> and that's what, uh, what uh, uh, marketing people exp uh, exploit, okay? So virtual world, and uh, what does this mean? It means that we will be experiencing worlds that are not there, okay? So actually building models that are completely uh, new and uh, who knows where that will be taking us we were talking about art before there are already artists that perform in virtual worlds so if you want to see their artwork you need to use a VR headset okay <coughs> so uh, and, and this on goes on, so this, for example, is an area that has been really considered by all of those that um, do social media analysis, for example. So there's been a growing trend, especially the last five, six years. Lots of people thinking, uh, on, one si on one side it is true, social media are a window on uh, humanity. It's the first time that you have so much information from so many people all at once. That was not possible before. So uh, since uh, we, we, we are computer scientists, what happens is that many, many colleagues started analyzing all of this data and analyzing all of this data saying, oh, social media say this, so this is happening, or social media is saying that, and this is happening. So this is not always true, for example, some colleagues a few years ago said that you could tell whether Obama would win the election from social media. Uh, this is clearly nonsense. But there are other works that are instead inferring information from social media or not only social media, also from uh, search engine. For example, uh, this is four or five years uh, ago, there was um, a group from Google, uh, this was on a search engine, so not social media, they were observing that uh, there was one medication that was searched online, okay? After a while, uh, the same person was searching for another medication, some time passes, and uh, the same person searched for diabetes. So they said, okay, is it possible that there is an interaction between these two medications that get a person to develop diabetes? It was the case. So they figured out from, social, uh, from a search engine 
that uh, there was uh, an interaction between two treatments that was actually getting people uh, to get diabetes. And that was then proved by clinical studies a year later. Okay, so that was uh, something else that I've been working on few um, past two or three years. Uh, I, I've been looking at, for example, the perception of pollution. Okay, we all have this idea of pollution, but you never understand whether it's just a perception or I it is really something that uh, you can then corroborate with hard data, okay? And so we've been looking at what people say online and uh, sensor data. And we figured out that when people complain a lot, and we observe this in China, in France, and in Brazil, yeah, when people complain a lot, there are high particular matter values. The other way around is not true, but uh, when people complain and perceive this, there is actually a very high chance that the particular matter values are high. So PM 2.5, PM 10, you know, uh, if I, I guess you all know what I'm talking about. <coughs> there is a, another possible relation, many people are also working on this. Uh, computers are being trained to emulate what human beings do. Why? Because at that point you can have a computer substitute a human being, okay? Performing that same task. Think of sensors, for example, especially uh, also on food, quality of food, taste. These are all areas where you can have uh, or can, uh, or ha there are at least people working on uh, systems that can have the same type of uh, uh, perception that a human being would have. Think of the aesthetic quality of a picture. Okay, there's been work, for example, on, uh, and uh, it's interesting because uh, it is true that uh, uh, there is a, a subjective view of what is beautiful, but uh, uh, clearly computer scientists look at quantitative uh, uh, data, there are also many, many uh, indicators coming from, for example, Greek, uh, so there is, a, uh, I've seen lots of work considering the golden ratio that was used by Greeks also for uh, temples, I think, and, uh, uh, or um, also how you take uh, a picture, so uh, distinguishing whether a picture is well taken if the subject is exactly at the center of the picture or there is uh, any shift in it, okay? So these are all measures that you can actually use. So this is also a new frontier, especially if you look at point A. So perceptual interfaces, we have computers that become capable of interpreting human beings. There was a stream of work, especially in the past year. Past years, uh, um, uh, we would talk about uh, emotional browsing. What does emotional browsing mean? So instead of just browsing and using a browser, uh, typing a keyword or uh, typing a URL in it, you have a browser that interprets your mood, interprets uh, what time of day it is. And if you think of it, there are already systems that do that. You, there are also, uh, for example, music playing systems that at same, some times of the day will play some music instead of others. There's always this idea of profiling, understanding, providing the right type of information at the right time, okay? B instead is something more uh, classic, especially in uh, uh, computer science. Uh, so the problem of uh, human-computer interaction. So uh, human-computer interaction is clearly an, uh, I mean, a huge area that has been uh, where many, many people are working on. And the, here the idea is how do you build a system where a person can feel comfortable in its interaction, okay? So 
you can make an I mean, many different, uh, many different examples, especially in the past years. W maybe one of the most disruptive and interesting one is, um, how many of you have ever played with the Wii? Okay. So Wii, uh, for those of you that use that, uh, so um, uh, how was the graphics, in your opinion? Was it good or bad compared to PlayStation or, or Xbox? It was bad, right? So incredibly, that's a perfect example where you see that human-computer interaction has a, a greater role than the actual quality of the content that you're showing, okay? Because the moment that you put a person uh, in the position that he feels comfortable playing as using the Wii, uh, the engagement that you develop with the game is much better than the engagement that you would have with uh, the best computer graphics in the world, okay? So that is a, a perfect example of human-computer interaction. Then after that uh, came uh, Kinect, for any of you that uh, tried that. So this idea of uh, naturally uh, interacting with a computer system. So when we think of, uh, uh, here I will uh, conclude, so wh when we think of uh, aesthetics and computer science, well, uh, it's actually a, a whole world of <laughs> many, many, many different aspects that you can consider. And uh, it's interesting, uh, uh, again, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking again about uh, the history, let's say the past 20 years of uh, literature that um, I've, I, I've been seeing, uh, as for example, also in the human-computer interaction community, there was not so much this idea of uh, an aesthetic role uh, compared to uh, a functional role, for example, of an interface. While instead, in the past few years, so this is uh, more recent, uh, I could say three, four, five years, there is instead uh, an understanding of this uh, deep connection that there is. Deep connection that, uh, again, I, I find uh, much, uh, at least for me, it's much more clear to understand if you think that aesthetic has, aesthetics has to do with perception. And uh, human perception today is greatly influenced by computer systems. So this is uh, really an area that uh, I think an exciting area and uh, an area that still has a lot to say. We, we, we don't really understand it so much because it's, and I don't know how, if you can say, really say you can gra we will get to grasp it totally at some point because it is also true that technology is developing us at a fast pace and uh, when you get to one point, there will still be a new point to understand. So you, 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 it's really work that never ending work in that sense. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Uh, I don't know if, yeah, thank you very much.